Um, Ezekiel, I'm reading from Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 1 to 5, and then Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 to 12. And it'll be up there. Then the man brought me to the gate facing east, and I saw the glory of, God, of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. The vision I saw was like the vision I had seen when he came to destroy the city, and like the visions I had seen by the river Kibar, and I fell face down. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Okay, now 47, 1 to 12. The, ba the man brought me back to the entrance to the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me round the outside to the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross. Because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross, he asked me, Son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, This water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Araba, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish, because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Eglim. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left salty. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their will, leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fall. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. The fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Thank you, and PNG. Uh, good to be with you, all nice to see you this morning. And it's lovely to come in the sunshine, isn't it? It's great. And it feels nice and warm in here, a little bit too warm maybe. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you're here. Thank you for your word. Just pray, Lord, as we look at it now, that you'll speak to us through it. In Jesus' name, amen. This is now the, the final in our series on the book of Ezekiel, and uh, boy has it been, uh, for me personally, it's been uh, really, really encouraging. I've almost lived in it uh, for these past weeks that we've been doing it, because I've read it, I reread it, and looked at it, and it's been great. But in this passage we had read to us, uh, especially the second, sec the second part from uh, Ezekiel uh, 47, there's one phrase that captured my mind some weeks back when I read it, and it stayed with me, and that was the phrase, did you see this? Did you see this? Or do you see this? Um, I expect you use that phrase uh, with your friends, did you see that? Um, my younger son, Anil, he's the one that often says that to me, Dad, did you see that? And it's usually about football, and uh, 
said, did you see that match? Well, a couple of weeks ago, a footballer by the name of Alison Becker, he's the goalkeeper of Liverpool, for those of you who know who that is and so on. He, remember he's a goalkeeper, he went out onto the pitch, 94th minute of the match, and he went out and he scored a header and they won. It's the first time a Liverpool keeper has ever scored and it's the first time uh, a Premiership uh, goalkeeper actually scored the match-winning goal. Amazing. So Anil said, Dad, did you see that? So I made sure I saw that and I really enjoyed that. Um, in this passage, um, we'll come back to that in a moment, but there's so many things that God shows Ezekiel and they're absolutely mind-boggling, so challenging. And it, I'm not sure if you know, but this book, uh, for those uh, from the Jewish background, they weren't supposed to read it until they were 30 because it's so frightening and the visions in it were so terrifying. And uh, Ezekiel himself was only 30 when God started to give him these visions. So imagine the trauma he must have gone through because he's actually seeing them. He's not just writing them down for others to read. He's actually seeing these things that God has given him. And uh, poor chap, he, he goes through a lot, lots of things that God demands of him, and he's obedient. He says, lie down on your one side for months on end, and only eat this particular food these number of times a day. And he does it. And he says, turn over, lie on the other side. And he does it. And then a little bit later on, his, his wife dies, and God says to him, don't mourn. And there's a reason in all these things, and I'd encourage you to read the book, because it is fascinating. And he doesn't mourn. You know, when you're just listening to the news and hearing the number of deaths recently, it just makes you, you can't help but feel sad in your own self, and you feel like mourning. And if you've lost loved ones or whatever in recent months, you know, you, you can't help. Emotion wells up within you. And um, this, this uh, last uh, vision or vision, a series of visions that God gives him starts at chapter 40 and it goes through 48. And the, uh, another verse that, that caught my attention was right at the beginning and uh, it's Ezekiel 40 verse 1 and it says this, In the 25th year of our exile, at the beginning of the, the 10th month, the 40th year after the fall of the city, on that very day, the hand of the Lord was on me and he took me there. So that bit in there, it says, on that very day struck me. So why is Ezekiel emphasizing that, that particular date? If you look through the, the prophecies of, in that book, he dates them. Every time God meets with him, he puts a date, which is unusual. It doesn't really occur... Uh, um, I don't think it occurs much anywhere else uh, in the Bible, but he dates them. And it caught my attention, so I looked it up. It was a date when uh, the, the Jewish people, again, they celebrated the day that they came out of Egypt and then they entered the land of Jordan. They crossed the Jordan, this river that God stopped, and they crossed on dry land, and they entered their inheritance. And uh, I think it related to and the fact that God is showing Ezekiel, you might be in this situation now, but there will be a new time, like there was for the, for the Israelites of old, your ancestors, there will be. You've done bad, you've done wrong, but I still love you. you know, that's a message to take away this morning if you've not heard that. You, know, if you, you may have messed up, you may have fouled up, you must have, may have done so many things wrong, and you feel God doesn't love you. But let me remind you, God never stops loving anyone. That's not an encouragement to go and be bad. That's actually an encouragement to be good and to love him back. He's so good. And in this dire, dire situation that they find themselves in, God is saying, I love you. I haven't forgotten you. And it's sig signified by the day of, there's hope for you, there's a new future. And then the uh, passage from Ezekiel 43, it reminds us, uh, actually shows us that God's presence will one day return. That's a vision of that. You may recall that the first sermon in the series was on God leaving the temple. You may remember. I think it was the first one, or one of them. God left the temple because they were so bad, the Israelites, and he gave them centuries of opportunity to repent and turn, turn around, but it was the final straw, and he, and he leaves. And, um, 
And as he's, as he's uh, leaving, he hovers, this, this, this image of God leaving, hovers, looks back, looking back, thinking, I don't really want to go, you're my people. But the image in 43 is God's presence coming back, and he's in there very quickly. God wants to be with his people. That has always been his heart, right from the beginning, from the Garden of Eden to Jesus coming to the end in Revelation. God's heart is always to be with his people. And he comes in, and this is again a vision from chapter 43, that his presence would return. So he gives Ezekiel hope in a situation where they were in exile, and had been there for 25 years, they'd lost hope. But on that very day, when they remembered crossing the Jordan, God says, you will go again. There will be a new temple. And in the beginning of, that, in the beginning of these set of chapters, God shows uh, Ezekiel a whole series uh, of areas, including uh, of the temple, and he takes him with him, and he measures up every, every little bit of the space. If you read it, I warn you now, it's quite dull, okay? Because he takes a stick out, says, measure this, unless you're an architect or, you know, a surveyor, you go out there with a measuring rod, and you, and you oh, that's quite fascinating. But actually, it's, it's, just a little bit, it's a little bit boring and dull. But it's, um, it's worth a read, because it's, 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 it's an image of a future hope that God is giving Ezekiel and the people of Israel that are in exile, saying, there, there is hope, don't give up, I'm still with you. And and uh, in chapter 43, his presence is there, but then he takes him around. And this same guide, this bronze man, as is described in, 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 uh, in uh, the earlier chapters again, he's, he now brings him around back to this entrance of the temple, and he says, let's go in there, takes him in, and he shows him the source of this river that we read about in chapter 47. And it comes from the, uh, the threshold and from via through the altar within the temple. I don't know if you're aware, but we have two rivers in Southampton. Did you know? Yeah, we have one just, just not far from here. For those of you going to go to Vinny's house, you'll cross one. And if you go up towards Totten, there's another one called the Test. And, you know, I, I got interested because I've never really looked it up before. I thought, I'll see the source of these rivers. So the river, the river Test is from just the other side of Basingstoke. Uh, it starts there. And the River Itchen starts just near Oldsford. They're not very long. They're under, 30, under 40 miles long. And they, they come, come this way. But the source of this river uh, was the, the temple. And you know, it's not good having water in buildings generally. Not, not free-flowing water. We've had this place leak a few times already. And uh, just on f last Thursday, I think it was, or Friday, I was doing some final bits of prep on this. And I got a call from money. I was saying, Dad, come quickly. There's water coming in. <laughs> so we went there. We couldn't find the stopcock. Uh, they've only recently moved into the house. Anyway, we managed to find it. But, but this guide, he takes him and says, look, 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 this is where it's coming from. I can just imagine him doing that. Look at that. That's where it's coming. And then he say, takes him outside. And he says, says, follow me. And he starts to follow him. And he got his measuring stick out again, 1,000 cubits. How did he do that in the water, I wonder? But anyway, he measures off a thousand cubits, which is about 500 meters or a third of a mile, and the water starts to increase. And by then, it's ankle deep. And you can see Ezekiel rolling up his socks, maybe taking off his sandals, and because he, he's going through, that word through appeared repeatedly through the river. He goes another thousand cubits, another 500 meters, a third of a mile, and he, it's up to his knees, rolling up his trousers. Maybe he thinks it's not worth it anymore, just lets his clothes go. And then another thousand cubits and it's up to his waist now it's getting a bit more difficult um you know those of you who like swimming in the sea or rivers do you like that anyone like that It'd be really nice today wouldn't it go in that sea uh when we when we go my wife usually goes with me and uh, i have to hold her hand because she's a bit worried by now if it gets that high anyway then they've got another thousand cubits and now it's deep enough to swim in and uh Maybe it's at least six foot. It would be for me, that would be enough for me. I'll be five foot, maybe enough for me, but it's six foot for them. And anyway, they're swimming in it. And you know, at that point, he says, do you see this? I wonder if they're swimming around. And he's saying, do you see this? He really wants him to be aware 
there is, there is, there is this source of blessing, this source of life, this source of uh, flow that's coming from the threshold of, of, of the temple through the altar, which is, which is there. You know, for us, when you think of all that imagery that he's giving, and uh, Ezekiel wouldn't have realized that because they would have had the old system of sacrifice. But for us who are sitting here this morning, we, we know who was sacrificed on that altar. We know that it was Jesus. And every blessing that we have this morning, as people who follow Jesus, anyone who wants to follow him, is through Jesus and him alone. This, this, this river had no other tributaries. It wasn't coming, there wasn't other ones meeting. It was just from that threshold. And it's miraculous. It does not happen from a little trickle to that, that, that depth in such a short space of time. But it happened. That source of life-transforming river is the blood sacrifice of our Jesus, the Lamb of God, who offered himself in our place on that cross to pay the price of our sin, your sin and my sin, to take the punishment that we deserve away from us. And every, every blessing that we have, every, everything you see within that, within that river flow is ultimately from that same source for us today. All comes from the presence of God. So that was the source of the river, the, the, the size of the river. As I said, it gets deeper and deeper, and it's a miraculous flow. And the trickle becomes huge, as we've read. And, uh, you know, as you, as you imagine that river, you think about, the words, certainly for me, the verses that came to my mind as I was reading it, was uh, when Jesus met that lady at the well, and she, he, he's asked her for a drink, and Jesus says back to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who is it that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. In another place, Jesus stands up, and it says this, and Jesus, no doubt, has got this imagery from Ezekiel in his mind, and it's a great feast, there's thousands of people around him. He stands up, and in a loud voice, he says, let anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture have said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. God wants to bless us with the richest blessing we have, but we have to want it. That flow from the throne of God has never stopped. Jesus died 2,000 years ago. He was raised. He's alive today. Last Sunday, we celebrated Pentecost, the outpouring of God's Spirit. God's spirit is still here today. And once we put our trust in him, he comes and lives inside us. It might be a little trickle to start with, uh, a little seed, a little start of a trickle of a river. But it's as we continue to thirst for more and more of God, it becomes a river. I wonder how thirsty you are this morning. You know, if you're content, God will not force it upon us. But he will give us as much as we want. And if you think about the final end of that river, how deep it was. There's no end. You will, never, you will never run it dry. God will never run dry. If you want that flow in your life, if you want that blessing of, of his life in you, it is there. And, um, you know, there's, there's all these symbolic meanings, uh, but also real meanings of, of what, what, what these verses mean. But there's also an ultimate meaning when this, uh, these things that Ezekiel is shown will one day be, will be fulfilled. You know, we see this image of the river time and time again in Scripture and finally in, in Revelation 22 as well. It's a place where it flows. There's also the image, the same image, if you think about um, how, the, how the message of Jesus was spread. It was spread from a tiny little country in a tiny little place in the Middle East. Twelve men sharing the gospel and it spread from J Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the world. You know, we sat here this morning, people of many nations, but it started with a trickle. God's blessing flowed from the fact that Jesus had died, he'd risen, he's ascended, he sent his Holy Spirit, fired up men to preach that message, and it's reached us. People from Faroe Islands, people from India, from Iran, from Malaysia. Praise God. It has not stopped. It's become a flood of people across the world. Thank you for that. So we've looked at 
the source of the river, the size of the river, and the power of the river. Amazing power. This river gathers up and it ends up and it, fl- it, it drops into what is known as the Dead Sea. Anyone know why the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea? It's salty. Yes? Yeah, it's very low, that's right. But, yeah, the obvious answer is dead. It's, it's not a trick question, it's, really, it's dead. But when you look at the imagery of this, what these verses say, it brings life to the dead. It brings life. Um, it transforms that, that valley, that, 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 that sea. It's... And it's imagery also of the Garden of Eden. You know, there, there's verses in here which talk about there'd be a great number of trees, there'd be swarms, swarms of creatures, and there'd be a river flowing through the land, which is again seen in, in, in uh, Revelation 22, as I said. There's also the, the theme of resurrection. We've seen that already in the Valley of the Dead Bones. Here again, death is defeated, is done away with, when, when, when the river empties into that sea, it says there, the water there becomes fresh. It's healed. There's healing in that, in that river. You know, if you think about what's happening in that vision of the Dead Sea, it's a, it's a vision of abundance. Um, I don't know if any of you have drunk a bit of sea water. You've been in swimming in there. It's disgusting stuff, isn't it? And the taste stays with you for ages. You drink this stuff or taste it, it's eight or nine times worse. It's basically a chemical dump into that sea that's, that's currently there and it's still there today. 300 square meters of just this, this massive lot of chemicals. You know, the grace of our Jesus Christ flows into this dead and degraded world and it brings life. Jesus' death and resurrection and his ascension and his sending of the Holy Spirit has brought life onto this planet. It also brings life into these dead hearts. You know, a whole, whole series has been called A New Heart. If you want an image of a dead heart, there's nothing good lives in us. The Bible tells us that. You might think I'm a pretty decent person, and I think I'm pretty decent. I mean, most of us think we are, but God's standard is perfection. And we see that it's dead. We can do nothing good out of ourselves. We need his spirit, his life, giving spirit to flow within us so that we may be able to do some good that God has prepared for us to do. Uh, Ephesians tells us we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but we've been made alive through him. You know, this, this dead heart, this, this dead and renewed heart that's been renewed and been brought back to life, it's not just for us to be content. We, God sends us out to feed the hungry, you know, you see healing and people being fed there. There's image of these people standing and fishing. There's, there sends out, send, gives us a heart to want to go and bring healing to the world around us. God gives us a power within us to do that. You know, the meaning of the river, it may be, in some areas, maybe symbolic, but there's also this promise of a, of a, a kingdom to come through, through the Lord Jesus. And you know, there's never ever been a river like this in Jerusalem, and there still isn't. But the new Jerusalem that God is preparing, there will be. I wonder if you're part of that. I wonder if you're part of that family of God who will, who will be part of the new, uh, enter that new place that God is preparing. God wants us there. His heart right from the beginning is to be with his people. And right at the end, the final verse in, uh, in the book of Ezekiel, it says that the Lord is there. This, this city is given a new name. Jerusalem is given a new name in this, in, this, uh, in this book. The Lord is there. That's been his heart. I wonder if God is living in your heart this morning. And if you want to enter the, the, the new Jerusalem, there's a condition, and that's through Jesus, the one whose blood flows from the altar in that temple and it has become a massive river around the world that no one can stop, that no one can cross. But you can be part of it, you can be in it. The Lord is there. Is the Lord in your hearts this morning? If it's not, don't leave. If he's there, maybe 
There's some saltiness has come back. There were some salt deposits left in that image. Again, God is there for refreshing this morning. If you want refreshing from the Lord, he's here. There's prayer team here, happy to pray with you. You can pray on your own, Lord, refresh me. I want to be new this morning in you. Let's pray. Well, I thank you this morning for Jesus, that we're blessed only through him and only through what he's done. We thank you this morning, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Without you, we're hopeless and helpless. We're dead in our trespasses. Lord, help us not to think we can do anything good on our own. But with you, Lord, it, the potential is limitless. Lord, you've given us your spirit that we might be fruitful, that we might touch the lives of those around us. We might feed those that are hungry, seeking you. We might heal the world around us that's hurting. Lord, help us. Heal us first, we pray. Day by day, may we be refreshed in and through you. Father, we thank you that you love us that much. Lord, no matter what we've done, you've never left us. Lord, you love this world so much that you sent Jesus to die for it. Father, I pray that you renew our vision, Lord, of who you are and how much you love us. Lord, keep our, our hard hearts supple. May we not let the saltiness of this world enter in again. Refresh us again, I pray, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.